All right, it's one o'clock. Pretty full room. It's really awesome to see this room so full. We might even, we were supposed to be book solid, so we might even get a couple more people straggling in. But let's go ahead and get started since it is one o'clock. And um, this might take the it might take the whole time depending on how far we go. But so let me introduce myself. My name is Rusty Devine. Um, yep, good for yourself. I'm a software developer currently working at Nebraska Department of Roads, and I've been doing development for about 15 years. Uh, I'll introduce my co-facilitators. They also work at the Department of Roads with me. This is Mr. Kyle Wilson. Spell Kiel, pronounce Kyle. Kiel? K-E-I-L. I know. K-E-I-L. Yeah. You want to talk a little bit about your position? Yeah, sure. I, I started at the Nebraska Department of Roads about right around two, year 2000. Um, was a developer for a number of years and fell into more of a project management role around 2007, 2008 as the department transitioned to uh, .NET as their single development platform. Um, we're still transitioning, by the way. It's been difficult to get rid of all the, there's about a dozen platforms that we were maintaining at that point, including VB5 and VB6, some VB4. Uh, I was a COBOL <laughs> mainframe, Lotus Notes, I was a Lotus Notes guy, yeah. we boo now. Um, so, uh, Agile was a really key part of that transition to learning .NET. I mean, teaching a bunch of COBOL notes, VB developers, how to develop a .NET. Um, so we started that transition back in 2007 and, um, and kind of taken off from there. It's been an evolution and it continues to evolve. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Kyle. And Mr. Adam Cosmeter, he's again also works at Department of Roads. Adam, you want to tell a little about yourself? Yep. I'm a senior developer at the Department of Roads working with .NET mostly web technologies, and pretty much OpenNet is my world, my forte, web technologies as well. But I've been working with these gentlemen at Rhodes, and we also work together at a different company uh, called Five Nines Technology Group, where we did custom app dev, uh, doing pretty strongly agile methodologies there. That's great, because that's, that's where we developed or honed this process that you guys are going to help us with today. So that was probably two years ago now. We all worked at Five Nines, and then um, the company is mostly outsourced IT. Well, it's a very small software development practice. And we decided after a while that the software development practice just wasn't getting off the ground. So we ended up shutting it down, and all of us followed different routes, but it back, ended back up at the Department of Roads working with each other, so it's great. Okay, so. So what are we going to do today? I don't know, how many of you, show of hands, were in this morning's keynote talk? Yes, yeah, so you might recognize this. I thought this was fantastic how Micah put this up. But he was describing um, project leadership and versus project management and the life cycle of a project. And I thought it would be a good to throw up on the board as a sort of continuation from this morning. So um, the, this afternoon, we're going to be talking about this stage right here, where you're trying to figure out what this project is and how big is it is. And it sounds like Mike is actually doing something very similar, where he will go out and, and talk to a customer, and he'll charge a price, a fixed price, or maybe maybe it's a CNM, but anyway, he charges a separate price for this stage of the project, and then at this point, he says, all right, if you want to continue, this is what your estimate looks like. And that's really the heart and soul of kind of what we're doing today. We want to um, look at this project, try and figure out what, what is it, why, are you, why do you want it, who wants it, and why do they want it, and then end up with you know, a pretty good estimate. So by the end of the day, we're going to take a look at a user group website, um, and we want to come up with just a, what's a fantastic user group website? And not just for us, as you know, someone who might want to go to a user group, but you know, who, who all would need features on this user group website? And why would they need it? And what kind of things would they look for? So we're going to try and put ourselves in different roles and different shoes and say, well, you know, if I was the host of a user group that was coming to my building, what would I want? What would I want on the website for me? So we'll take a look at that. So by the end of the day, we'll come up with a pretty good plan for, for this part, discovery of, you know, what will make a great website. I just want to do a, a quick survey, um, just to raise the hands. How, how many of you guys have done Agile or do Agile now at your organization? Are you familiar with Agile? That's great, because I'll throw out some terms like iteration and, and stuff. And if I ever say something that you're not clear on, you, it looks like almost everyone knows. Either ask a neighbor or just interrupt me. You can shout out anything during, um, during the session today. Yeah, it's a safe forum. 
please yeah. feel free to not not be concerned about your neighbor. Ask us that, we'll give you a, a good response or as best as we can. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Yeah. yeah, we'll actually be breaking up into groups a little bit later, so it'll be you won't have to listen to me talk all day, luckily. Um, so a lot of you did Agile. How many of you have experienced reading or writing user stories? Great. Looks like a lot of you do, and that's good. We're going to capture features today as user stories, and that's kind of a as a you know user, I want something, and this is why I want it. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to do that, and Adam will cover that pretty well. So even if you're not familiar with it, I think you'll pick on up on it pretty quick. So and if not, we'll be working in groups, and you'll probably be paired with someone that uh, does know how to do it. Well, how about user groups? Who here has been to a user group or frequents user groups? Good, great. Yep, so there's one in town. There's the Lincoln.net user group for sure. There's a, um, I think there's a JavaScript one in Omaha, maybe one in Lincoln too. But there are a couple of user groups around. But that's, when we were thinking about a topic for today that might be relevant to you guys, that was when we came up with something that, okay, I can understand what, what we want from a user group. So that's what we'll be talking about today. So. How many people have been part of a project or, or just witnessed part of a project that struggled during this stage of development? Like, really had a hard time getting off the ground and getting to here. Either, you know, spending too much time planning, months and months planning, and discussing and arguing and going back and forth and people can't agree. Or maybe jumping in too quick and just starting to code, and then not really, when you get here to the handing off the code, it's not really what people want. Well, if you've had that experience, as I, I have, unfortunately, then you sh you'll really appreciate this process, because what we do is we want to get every everyone involved in the project, everyone who wants to see um, the success of a project, into the room at the same time to talk about what their vision is and agree on what their vision and what their priorities are. Because if you don't have that, if you, if you start a project and you talk to the one person who calls you up and says, hey, I want something, and you work with them throughout here and you get to here and the end users actually see it for the first time over here, you're going to be like, I can't use this. It doesn't do A, B, and C. So I think it's really important to you know, get the, all the stakeholders in the room at the same time. I was going to point out, Rusty, I, I don't know how you guys manage and run projects, obviously. I will say that at the Department of Roads, where I've worked for quite a long time, you know, typically a project initiation, which is this discovery phase, the project initiation can take um, several weeks to several months. And, um, it, and it's a problem. Even though we've done this process a lot, we still struggle at the Department of Roads to get people to think about investing four hours into doing this and then getting the project going. It's, it's a little bit wacky for us because people tend to think, well, four hours in a meeting, I can't dedicate a half day. I don't have a half day to give to the project. And, and it's crazy because what winds up happening is they spend several hours, you know, many more hours than four hours in meeting after meeting. Half of those meetings you know, are getting back up to speed from what we talked about in the previous meeting. Um, you know, and, and so when we talk today about this process, part of it, the idea behind it is to jumpstart jump project initiation. It's to get that project initiation up, defined, and going to a point where you can start work in a pretty rapid fashion. Um, you know, in enterprises that are the size of the Department of Roads, it, you know, it is difficult sometimes to convince people we can get up and going a little faster than we've been going. So that's, that's the goal of this, this process, I think, today. Yeah, that's excellent. Thanks, Kyle. So that, that's like, it's kind of like why we started doing this too. That's a good lead in. So why did we decide we had to do this process versus you know, spending months building a charter? Well, when the three of us were at Five Nines, uh, we were a consulting company. So a customer would come to us with a project idea and say, oh, you know, I've got this great idea for a, a mobile app. And we'd spend some time with them. Uh, okay, what do you want? You know, okay, I see what you want. Okay, let's try and understand what you want, your domain, how big it is. And all the while, we're not even charging them yet. We're just trying to, oh, you know, elicit what they, kind of what they want. And we're doing a, a little bit of a short circuit of it, just trying to get it really quick. And so 
we'd still spend a significant amount of time and get to here and say, okay, hey, if you want this project, everything you told me about, it's going to be $80,000. And you'd say, what? I thought this was going to be $10,000, you know? And that was it. So we'd lose, you know, I don't know, 40 man hours of trying to talk to these people and get, get the requirements and just to find out, oh, everything, there's either technology mismatch or uh, personality mismatch or you know, budget constraints that weren't <coughs> realistic. So one day, um, a guy from a peer group of our company, so it was a company like ours, but in a different state, he came to town and met with Kyle and I, and he's like, oh yeah, I do this different process. I, I just charge a little bit up front, and then we have a, you know, a meeting or two with a customer, and at the end of the meeting, we do a little bit of work afterwards, and I can tell them how much it's gonna cost. But you know, they pay something up front for that initial discovery phase. And then if they you know, want to do the project, they can. If they don't, fine. So we're like, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what we need to do. So we started charging um, $1,500 basically for um, you know, a meeting or two and, and a little bit of analysis up front to try and price this project. And that really had a couple of immediate benefits. First, it weeded out some customers. So like, $1,500 to get that? Why would I pay you? And like, no, don't. And I think that was good because I don't think they were going to be good customers. If they can't afford, you know, the fifteen hundred dollars to figure out what their project is, they're not going to be able to afford a forty thousand dollar or whatever. You know, and, and likewise for if it's your organization, if they can't dedicate, if they don't see the value of dedicating a four hours to a meeting, then maybe the project's not worth doing. And they're not going to be good customers for you. So that's kind of why we we started doing this. And it was it was really working well for us. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have a good sales pipeline, so. But that, that's kind of how we got to here today. We want to share this process with other people. Maybe it'll help you out. And, and by the way, that's why there are Pluralsight um, passes. So this is a three-month pass of Pluralsight. I'm currently working on a Pluralsight course on this topic. This will be out in June. So I asked Pluralsight if I could get a bunch of passes and things for you guys. So feel free to take those. And Adam brought these mints in. So. Got your back. Smells, yeah. I know you all had lunch. <laughs> as soon as he opened that bag today, I was like, whoa, it's a fresh in here. So that was, yeah, that's good. Thank you for that. So that's kind of why, you know, that's how we got here. Um, that's where we're at today. And we do use this process at Department of Roads occasionally, um, but we still kind of bridge between the yeah. two. There's still, there's still people at the Department of Roads who say, well, I don't have four hours to dedicate to this thing. And you think, yeah. how important is that project, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I think the funny thing is, if you think about like infomercials, what do they do? They they try to sell you something at a big price, right, so that they can get as much money out of you. But they do it in little segments. So instead of this situation where we would say you can have your product, your blueprint for this project that you need for you know fifteen hundred dollars was ours at five nines, but instead they say for forty seven easy payments of a hundred dollars, <laughs> yeah. you can get this product, and then you end up paying way more than what you actually did instead of investing that one small time to be able to get it for much less. Yeah, exactly. It's not like we were saying, hey, we're just trying to nickel and dime you here. We would have had to do all this stuff anyway, and they would have paid for it somehow, but we just wanted to move that up front and just separate, you know, separate it out as a separate project. And so, we, you know, sometimes you have to explain that to people. It's not like we're being inefficient and, re rep you know, doing things that we wouldn't have to or doing things over and over. We're just kind of moving stuff up front. So this process is really good for when you have a new project and you have a bunch of people who are interested in it and you want to get their ideas and do some brainstorming and figure out what the path for this project is. It works great for that. It does not work well for a project that's really straightforward, something that's almost like a cookbook. Like um, step A, step B, step C. Um, something that you've done a hundred times and you don't really need to to clarify a focus or you know have people agree on it. It's pretty straightforward. This, this process is really for hey, I've got this new idea, or even I've got this existing prod, uh, product and I want to improve it. You can use something like this to help brainstorm those ideas. So today is a little bit different than normal. Normally we would have. Um, our customers come in, you know, three or four customers, and then three or four developers, and we do this meeting. And during the whole meeting, you know, throughout this whole agenda, everyone would be participating, and we'd be, you know, writing everything up on the wall. 
But since this group is a bigger group, we're going to end up breaking up into groups a little bit later. And that'll give each of you a chance to you know, write out some user stories and really get your voice heard on, on what this product could be. So that, that's going to be fun. Um, so part of the, the customers that come in, um, we always want, we talk to the customer beforehand about who, it, who it needs to come. And it's important that the customer brings in representatives from uh, the domain experts and you know, end users, and especially the product sponsor and the product owner, or project sponsor, project owner, depending on the project. And so who, who is that? Who is the project sponsor? Well, in my mind, a project sponsor is kind of the, the person that's going to pay the bill in the end. They're the person with the most cloud at the customer side. They're going to be able to clear organizational roadblocks. Um, they're usually kind of the boss of the project owner or the end users. We want that person in because obviously they're going to need to buy into this whatever we come up with. They're going to need to buy into it too. And the product owner. So the product owner is going to be the person who's it's sometimes the domain expert. It's sometimes the person who's going to be using this every day. It's the person that we're going to be talking to almost every day in stand-ups and we're asking them questions. And they're going to help us set up meetings and help facilitate the project and make sure everything's on track. So they're going to be the most involved with this. So those two are definitely very important um, representatives. Today, Kyle here is going to play the role for the product sponsor. So he's going to help, um, well, he's going to facilitate. So he kind of has two roles. He's going to help facilitate. But he's also going to help make decisions, final decisions on priorities and uh, order and what, what's important. But we want to try something a little fun, too. Um, the product owner. <coughs> The person who you know is kind of hey this is this is really the software you're making for me this is the thing I'm going to use the most we're going to see if someone from the group wanted to volunteer for that and so, so who has experience with user group websites yeah who has experience with user groups who's been to user groups who feels like oh yeah I could I could make some decisions it's not a very taxing role you'll still stick you'll stay at your table you'll work with your group but later when we get into talking about features You'll help Kyle, you know, say this is what this is what we really think is important. This is what this is where we want to draw the line for this project. So we're if anyone would like to volunteer to be our product owner today. I saw a couple of hands. Yep, you. Okay, what's your name? John. John. All right. Hey, Jim. Yep. Okay, great. Thanks, John. So we'll let you know. Um, uh, when your specific duties are up, but you know, definitely pitch in um, to all of the, the you know the brainstorming we're doing, and and let your voice be heard. <coughs> That's great. Thanks, John. Okay, so I think I've pretty much covered what I wanted to cover in the introduction. Do you guys have anything else to add to that? Yeah. Do these roles are these roles familiar to you guys? Do you work with them? Product. I see, I see one. No, no. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, re I really do want to reiterate, you know, the, the project sponsor or product sponsor, uh, this is a person with a overall vision, right? They have a high level vision of the project and they've got the clout to bust through the issues that are going to come up. So it's important to have them bought in. It's really important to get them in this meeting and they're typically, you know, at the Department of Roads, they're the ones who are like, four hours? I'm way too busy for a four hour meeting, yeah. you know? Um, the, the product owner is typically a line of business kind of person. But here's the key thing. They need to have vision over the entire process that you're trying to, trying to um, build. Because if they're not familiar somewhat with the different areas or aren't able to get familiar with those specific areas that you're going to cover in your product, then um, you, know, you wind up with kind of a, a, a singular focus. You, know, one, you, know, you wind up with one area of the product that gets a lot of attention because that's what this person specializes in. Um, you know, the accounting section of the application is really cool. But um, you know the place where we enter all of our data, that kind of, it's not very important. So, or the reports aren't very important, or something like that. So, I think um, I just want to be sure everybody understands that and why we need that. Um, is there a role that anyone feels like we've left out at this point? Because the rest of the, the rest of the participants are team members at that point, um, and that there's what we would call subject matter experts. Um, you know, they're the, the person from the accounting division that's an expert in accounting or the person, reporting person. Yeah. yeah. 
Scrum Master a role that has a lot of facilitation and stuff like that? Yeah, I, I think that's a good question. I think, you know, for this process, there is a so typically a facilitator, and that facilitator would be the Scrum Master often on the project that we're running. And there's, a, there's usually a lot of overlap there. Um, at, at the Department of Roads, we don't have Scrum, I mean, I'm a certified Scrum Master, so I do that at the Department of Roads, but I'm called a project manager, and that's the way they kind of run things. And I, in my experience, there's kind of a lot of overlap in organizations there as they're, as they're transitioning to Agile. Um, some organizations go in wholesale and they say, we're gonna go to training and we're gonna change the role names, our project ma uh, managers are gonna become Scrum Masters, or, and they go for it. But mm, my experience is it's, a, it's more typical, there's a slower transition there. So, but in the, in the scope of this process, uh, the facilitator is a facilitator, just like the Scrum Master facilitates um, agile projects, agile iterations. Is that your also a question about that? Yeah, you know, and the term product owner kind of overlaps both processes. You know, the product owner, we hope, will be the product owner for the project, too. Yeah, and I'd just like to reiterate, too, along those lines, that if you were in Micah's um, talk this morning, he talked about how important it was to get developers in right, you know, right at the beginning and get that, he called it, you know, instead of being a project manager, being a project lead and having the vision for the whole project. So the more people you can get in on the beginning that are going to be involved with that project, the better, because they'll get the context for what goes on in this meeting, and they'll understand it. Things that, that never get written down or included in scope documents, like personalities and, and issues and emotions and, and diversions and stories that happen during the meeting, if they're there to witness that, then they get a better gut feel for what the vision for this project is and what people are expecting. So it's really important to try and get everyone in up front that you can, at least a representative for them. So, good. Um, yeah. Okay. All right, so let's go over the agenda real quick for what we're going to do today. We just got through welcome and introductions. <clears throat> so next, uh, well, I guess we actually did an overview of the process, too. Uh, so the next step will be defining the objective, which is kind of like the vision for this project. We try and keep it to about you know a 25 word vision statement that describes you know, why we're doing this project. What, what is it? Why are we doing it? And then we'll talk about who wants to use this website? Who are all the different types of users who would come to this website from you know, attendees to um, you know, sponsors to whoever that would be? We'll try and brainstorm all those types of users. And, We'll do it up here on the board. And then we'll start thinking about, OK, for each of these types of users we talked about, what are they looking for? And why are they looking for it? What do they really need? And why do they need it? So we'll start by um, breaking out a couple together as a group. And then once you get the hang of it, we'll take a quick break around 2.30. And then um, you'll break up into groups after that. And you'll take a role or two from what we brainstormed and come up with features yourself from that role. Anytime you, you need to, just, you can take a break to you know, just lock out, whatever. Um, so then groups will get together and do that. And then we'll have you uh, present your best features. We'll just kind of go around the room and you'll say, all right, um, as a whatever, you know, I want this. And, and, and we'll come up, we'll take that feature from you and we'll start putting them up on this board. And then at the end, we'll say, okay, now let's talk about out of this group of features, what's really most important? We'll, we'll start having you help us rank what's really important. And then once we have them ranked, we can actually say, OK, so given this list, where should we start? What's that core feature set that makes this project worth doing? Um, finally, we'll wrap up with a little bit about what we would do after a meeting like this and what we're going to do after this meeting particularly. And then you know, if we have some time, we'll do a little Q&A. So, um, let's see. Oh, ground rules. I was going to go over the ground rules real quick before I turn it over. So <laughs> these are fun. I, I love these ground rules. Adam is uh, our conflict resolution master, so he's probably going to help me out the most today or help us out the most. People get very passionate, and it's good because, you know, we, typically this is a little different than normal. You guys haven't been thinking about, oh, I, I have this great idea for a user group website for the past two months. But, you know, generally our customers will have this, this drive and they want this product. And it's really easy to diverge into arguments and discussions and opinions and stories. And so it's important to, to have something to point back to and say, look, this is great. We need to, we need to table it to respect everyone's time. 
Um, you know, if someone is kind of getting upset, say, hey, look, you know, remember we, we went over these ground rules. This was kind of our contract with each other. We're, we're going to be nice. We're going to be kind, show respect. We're going to try and keep the diversions to a minimum because we only have four hours here. Um, remember that when you hear someone throw out a bad idea, that's fine. It'll, if it's truly bad, the group will sort it down to the bottom and it won't matter. So, you know, bad ideas are welcome. We're really just brainstorming. And then just, you know, be present. Participate and give un input because the more people that are giving their input, the better this product's going to be. So during a meeting, you know, we'll put these ground rules up and cover them just like we did just now. But it's, it's often time where we're like, you know, we should have, we should have probably, at that point in the meeting, we should have pointed back to this and said, whoa, let's bring this in. So maybe we'll see if we can do that today if you guys can have control. So. There's also the point, really, go ahead, Evan. Sometimes when you get really focused or really you know, charged or passionate about something, it's really easy to forget something as simple as those little rules. And when you don't have them in an open and visible spot, you know, it's, it's really hard to point back to them. So you know how sometimes maybe you have, You've lifted your glasses and put them on your head, and then you're like, where are my glasses? Because you've got really focused on something. It's something that's so close to you, yet you lose sight of it still, even though it's something that's even touching you, like your glasses. So um, to get around that, to, to kind of curb some of that, you know, beat the conflict before it actually ever arises. We put those ground rules up there so that if something starts to come up, we can immediately turn back to that and in a delicate way, not necessarily slapping their hand, because we've already defined it, we could say, all right, well, let's make sure that we're, we're adhering to these things that we agreed to, kind of like a contract at the beginning of our meeting. I was going to say, this is the point where we tell everybody that it's a no screens meeting, so I want you guys to all put your laptops away. <laughs> yeah. and I'm kidding. Gosh. But, but during our regular sessions, we do, we do discourage screen time because, you know, when the, the project sponsor is, is in their phone the whole time, you know, it's, that can be a big problem. They're not getting bought in. Uh, we definitely want them engaged, so I encourage you guys not to be playing video games on your computers while we're doing <laughs> Yeah. Jeez, uh, I just had one thought, more thought about that, too. But, um, oh, yeah, and, and the point is that it's not that conflict's bad. It's just that we have a limited amount of time, and we can go all day arguing back and forth, but we don't have time for it. So yeah, it's it, not like that conflict's bad. It's just we don't It's have actually time. good, yeah. except if it gets personal. And that's true. It's not so hot. Yeah. And that's happened. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Are there any questions uh, before we move on to the to defining the objective? Because